Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to this presentation. Just a quick housekeeping announcement before I introduce our next speaker. Uh, this event may be recorded. Uh, please leave your camera on when possible. Please remain muted unless you are speaking. Um, please, you can raise your hand if you wish to speak during the presentation. Uh, otherwise, you can leave comments and questions in the chat box. Our next speaker is a wonderful clinician from the Philippines named Nathaniel Chua. Uh, he's got a great presentation today about a, an act consistent form of couples counseling that uh, some of you may not be aware of, but it's gaining a lot of steam in the United States at least. And there have been presentations about this form of therapy in previous ACBS uh, world conferences. So um, if Nathaniel, if you're ready, please go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Jacob. No, if I can figure out how to share my screen here, uh, just a moment. Okay, hold on. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you for everyone for coming. My name is Nathaniel Chua, and uh, thank you, Jacob, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start by uh, saying a few things about myself. Uh, I'm sure most of all of you, or most of you, don't know anything about me. I am a counselor here in the in the Philippines, and I've been working as a therapist since April of 2009, when I finished my graduate studies in counseling. And I have a little website called One Life Only. Uh, goes to show my existential roots. Uh, thank you to Dr. Philip Truscott, a good friend of mine who created this website for me. And uh, I wouldn't be here. Nobody would have known about me unless I had this particular website, All right? So by the way, um, I have counted my slides uh, to 46. So I want to finish this in 45 minutes. So I would have time to ask uh, you for questions uh, regarding my uh, little presentation here. So I'll try to finish each slide within a minute. And uh, if you want to uh, um, chime in with your question, feel free to do so. Uh, but I think because of the length of my presentation, uh, it would help if we could reserve the questions towards the end. Uh, when I'll probably be able to spare 15 minutes to uh, entertain any questions if there are, uh, are any, all right? So uh, my background in therapy, uh, in the Philippines, it's hard to survive as a counselor with a focus on a single population. So um, I remember I only went full time in 2017. So just about seven years uh, or eight years after I graduated, uh, I held down five jobs <laughs> before I went full-time as a counselor. And uh, because of that, I work with uh, a number of populations, basically po all possible populations, individuals, couples, and families with different presenting problems. So I got into couples ther therapy literally by necessity because it was part of my internship uh, requirement. Uh, so I was part of a radio broadcasting outfit that offered uh, advice on air and also free counseling sessions. Uh, I wasn't part of the, the broadcasting uh, team. Uh, it was run by a, a counselor and his wife and uh, I was the one in the back office uh, uh, accepting clients. So you can just imagine uh, the exposure I got uh, to different uh, populations and different concerns. So it was kind of nerve wracking, but at the same time, uh, very fruitful for my internship year. So uh, of course it wasn't long before, uh, you know, I saw the need for couples and uh, probably I would say even right now, majority of my clients are couples uh, because the Philippines is, uh, as you might know, the leading exporter of human capital. 
anyway, so this poses a great challenge to couples and their families, and of course, to individuals as well. So I'll share, uh, pardon me if I go really fast because I, I'm hoping to finish all of this in 45 minutes. So I, uh, I wanna share my act journey. I'm sure all of you have one. So I was trained uh, probably like many of you in psychodynamic psychotherapy. And basically doing specific protocols for specific syndromes. And I'm sure you've heard Stephen Hayes talk about that a lot. Um, uh, well, uh, I thought it was a uh, rather unsustainable because sometimes I find myself uh, buying a whole book just to deal with one client with one issue. So that would be rather expensive for me. So, and then uh, in about 2017, I, I was while I was the, doing my usual gardening work, I I listened to a podcast. Uh, I usually do that, uh, and I heard a couple of British psychologists talk about mindfulness and how effective it is for psychotherapy or for individuals suffering any kind of psychological issues. So I was kind of late in the game, but luckily I did uh, hear the buzz about mindfulness. My I have nephews and nieces who talked about their schools requiring them to have a short pause for a mindfulness meditation uh, during their breaks. So I was lugging along a, a speaker in a stroller bag uh, and doing formal meditations uh, with my clients. And I thought that was uh, kind of like not uh, my game. And uh, some clients would uh, ask me if I do any other thing other than uh, mind, uh, mindfulness, formal mindfulness meditation practices. And I couldn't really answer them because that was my first introduction to mindfulness-based psychotherapy. So uh, as I went through the books, uh, of course, uh, Stephen Hayes and Act uh, were quoted a, a lot of times or cited a lot of times. So I got curious what this was. And the first book I got was actually the original ACT book, which was published in 1999. I got to about five pages, I think, and I gave up. It's too technical. Uh, that was a really dense book. And finally, I got into uh, searching ACT for dummies uh, online. And lo and behold, the first book that I was suggested was Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. And that started my ACT journey. And uh, uh, I never thought that uh, all of these psychological issues that I shared with my clients uh, could boil down to just one thing, and which is experiential avoidance. So of course, uh, since I uh, work with uh, different populations, uh, next step would be doing ACT for couples. So let me just share first on my training in uh, couples therapy. <clears throat> so I was in my graduate studies, I, uh, I was uh, uh, trained in emotion focused therapy. And uh, uh, I think I realized that it wasn't really my cup of tea. It was very difficult to uh, go into very deep emotional conversations every time with clients, wherever they come in, whatever they come in with. So I've, I, sometimes I'd see clients for multiple sessions ended up running out of ways to get into those deeper emotions. And I thought it was kind of hard to reflect that in everyday couples life. You know, we're not always talking about the hard stuff or the deeply emotional stuff. And then of course I turned into the Gottman method because uh, you know, it was uh, really um, very popular, at least in my area. Uh, I heard, I saw a lot of citations about the Gottman method. And uh, I think the the primary drawback I saw was that uh, some of my couples would end up fighting about what they learned in therapy. Uh, it's not an affront to any of these approaches. It's just probably my style. Maybe I, I'm not fit for, the, uh, for these particular approaches. But they, uh, until today, I think there are some 
uh, reasons why I could apply what I learned in EFT and the Gottman method uh, in IBCT. So, of course, uh, when I learned ACT, surprisingly, I actually asked a question directly to Stephen Hayes, and uh, uh, I emailed Dr. Harris, and I got a response from one of his staff. And there's really no uh, approach for couples using ACT. So I ended up with one self-help book and uh, one clinical book. Uh, the clinical book was a little bit uh, complicated and uh, talked about schema. So it was pretty hard for me to apply to my couples. So I got into IBCT uh, literally by probably by insistence. You know, I uh, the first ACT workshop that I uh, went into online was ACT Immersion. So that was highly technical for some for a beginner. Uh, so it was uh, in the Philippines, we call that nosebleed, you know. Uh, I'd listen to Stephen Hayes. I know it's English, but I can't understand his English. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so uh, there were Facebook live segments in that workshop. And uh, that was an opportunity. I couldn't follow the modules. I was way behind, I was running way behind, but I made it a point to attend those Facebook Live events wherein we can ask uh, questions directly to Stephen Hayes. And uh, finally, in about a few uh, Facebook uh, Live segments, I was finally able to get Stephen Hayes to answer the question. And to my surprise again, he didn't say there's an act for couples. Uh, he said, well, uh, there's EFT, which I already knew about, and the other one was blah, 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 IBCT. So I couldn't remember the name, it was too long. <laughs> I said, okay, I remember IBCT. So, well, there's probably just one therapy approach out there that has such a long acronym, okay? So before I proceed, uh, I'd like to share some acknowledgements. First of all, uh, these were the people in my journey through ACT. Thank you to Stephen Hayes. Uh, this is an interview I did with him back in 2021, back when my uh, subscriber uh, base was just 50. And uh, I was inspired by what Stephen Hayes did for me. He did a two hour interview with me. And, uh, you know, uh, he said uh, he, in one of his podcast interviews, that even if there was just one person and person listening, or watching my YouTube channel, he would be there. Uh, and thank you, Steve, for walking the talk. And uh, I appreciate uh, your humility. And Dr. Russ Harris and an anonymous donor. When I joined the uh, ACBS in 2019, somebody out there gave me a copy of the Act for Beginners online workshop. And up until today, I still use uh, Dr. Harris's uh, techniques. Thank you to that anonymous donor and thank, thank you to Dr. Russ Harris. And of course, my two consultants, uh, Dr. Matthew Villat. Without him, uh, I wouldn't have a solid uh, grounding in uh, RFT. And RFT has really helped me with my act uh, work with my clients. And he's also one of those people who are so humble and uh, so easy to reach. And uh, Dr. Blake Evans, who has been my consultant for couples. I never thought I'd uh, be teary-eyed in a consultation session. And uh, that happened with him. Uh, he's helped me. Uh, I wouldn't have come to this level of mastery about IBCT without him. And of course, this guy over here, <laughs> the guy who introduced me, uh, Jacob. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, the type who likes to toot his own horn. Uh, so sometimes I run into some angels out there and Jacob, you're such an empowering person. He just saw one of my posts in the, one of the Facebook uh, contextual behavioral, uh, you know, uh, pages or groups. And uh, he got in touch with me and uh, I succeeded him as a chairperson of the DEI SIG. And uh, thank you, Jacob. I wouldn't be here without you. Nobody would have found out about what I do uh, without uh, your help. 
and of course, uh, one of the developers of IBCT, Dr. Christensen, and he's uh, also such a gracious person. He answered all my emails. Uh, he led me to people like Dr. Blake Evans and also uh, allowed me to attend one of his workshops. And uh, this was the YouTube interview I did with him. And of course, to ACBS, uh, this is the closest thing to church for me without the dogma. Uh, thank you, ACBS. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I hope we continue with uh, the inclusiveness that you have uh, shown uh, throughout my stay here. So let me go to my presentation proper. So uh, what are the challenges to long-term relationships in the Philippines? Well, a lot of them are really self-explanatory if you've done work with couples. So social media, dating apps, uh, long distance relationships, extended families, shame culture, and the religious culture. Let me just uh, quickly go through one of them, which is uh, dating apps. Well, you know, uh, uh, in uh, ACT, we're always concerned about context or RFT, context sensitivity. And dating apps, if couples meet through a dating app, you can see how that kind of context would uh, probably not, uh, it wouldn't have been, would not have been possible for the couple to meet without the dating app. But at the same time, it does develop some sensitivities because it's so easy to download the dating app and start chatting with some other uh, threat to a relationship. So let me go now to IBCT itself, an act consistent uh, approach to couples therapy, integrative behavioral couples therapy. So a little, a little introduction. So it is developed by uh, Andrew Christensen, Neil Jacobson and Brian Doss. If you noticed, I uh, put in bold letters uh, Neil Jacobson's name uh, because he died before, I think during or before the second trial of the approach. So if you know something about Neil Jacobson, he was part of the team that developed ACT or RFT, uh, but he he died before he, he was able to see the fruition of his work. Uh, in 2010, the US Department of Veterans Affairs adopted IBCT as one of its evidence-based treatments for couples. And for those of you who are not from the US or who are unfamiliar with what the VA is all about, this is the largest single healthcare facility in the United States. So the self-help book, if you're interested in uh, uh, IBCT, uh, it's a reconcilable differences, been translated to quite a few languages as you see. And uh, the research has clearly indicated that it is a promising evidence-based uh, treatment for couples, even from, for very serious and difficult cases. So I borrowed this term from the Gottmans, uh, the four horsemen of IBCT. Of course, we don't use that term for IBCT. So these are the four criticisms. Uh, unreasonable demands, uh, rejection, and cumulative annoyance. All right, so just take a note of that and see how you can uh, relate it to the, the outline that I will share with you uh, about what IBCT is all about. So part one will be uh, rules of the game. This is my little outline here. Main tools in IBCT. A deeper view, the paradox of change, uh, a mindfulness approach to couples therapy. And if I have time, which I doubt I will, uh, I'll talk about the six flexibility skills and how IBCT relates to them. So what are the rules of the game? You know, in uh, RFT, we usually talk about rules, right? So in IBCT, uh, we're focused more on functional rather than formal rules. So it's basically rule governed versus contingency shaped change. So in rule governed change, uh, we're focused on making changes in the way uh, the couples uh, trigger their actions or uh, the, the triggering actions of the couple 
or the inactions of the couple. So rule governed change is a deliberate change a result, as a result of specific uh, training or coaching from the therapist. So therapists would teach them communication skills or problem solving skills, uh, which uh, I think relates quite a bit to traditional behavioral couples therapy uh, or even the Gottman method. So I'll talk more about contingency shape change later on as we go through my slides. So what are the main tools in IBCT? You'd be surprised. There are just two, empathic joining and unified detachment. So IBCT is uh, basically, uh, you know, the saying less is more. So addition by subtraction. So we really do very little as IBCT therapists in the counseling room. And uh, let me start with empathic joining. So in IBCT, uh, there, we believe that there is a greater motivation to change when there is emotional connection or empathy. So they've done the studies and uh, they saw that long-term change uh, can be achieved more with empathy. And you know, if you're familiar with RFT or uh, act were more about uh, intrinsic motivations to change. So we try to develop context sensitivity, uh, if you're familiar with that in RFT, and contingency shape change or change due to the change in context. So the emphasis here in IBCT is about emotional acceptance. Uh, Dr. Christensen mentioned that in my interview with him. I couldn't understand what he meant by that at, at first. Uh, but now I realized, well, if you're able to open up to your partner uh, or spouse uh, with your more vulnerable emotions, then it comes to a level of emotional acceptance. So, you, of course, uh, we assume that there's no violence or severe verbal abuse uh, in a relationship because that's a given uh, if we deal with couples that uh, we assume or we part of the assessment is to see if there's any kind of threat to the physical or psychological safety of one of the partners. So uh, we, uh, we put more focus in contingency shape change in uh, IBCT because we think it uh, creates a longer lasting change, all right? So contingency shape change uh, comes about uh, spontaneously because there's a change of the context. Oh, uh, uh, you know, everything is a context and act, right? Like uh, your spouse is a context, your thoughts are a context, your own history is a context, uh, your, your physical environment is a context. All right. So let's go now to unified detachment. Okay. So I use a lot uh, of metaphors in my work uh, also with couples. Uh, I'm not sure if I can share some of them. Some of them are borrowed from ACT. So I kind of integrate ACT with IBCT once in a while with, you know, uh, I sneak in some of these metaphors at times. So I'd say like, it's like climbing up a mango tree we're, 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 we're known for our mangoes, right? Here in the Philippines. So, and looking down at your relationship uh, and having a more objective view of your, of your uh, journey as a couple. And uh, if you've been through one of Russ Harris's workshops, he would mention that, you know, uh, looking at your feelings like a scientist with curiosity. So I'll cite some examples of how we develop unified detachment in uh, IBCT. So uh, the qualities you like about your partner are like a coin with the flip side. So let's say uh, when you were dating, uh, uh, you liked your partner because your partner was always on time 
he was never late. And then as you change your context, and you get into a long-term li living in together or married relationship, uh, then uh, that particular quality can have a flip side. Well, he doesn't like being late. So you argue about, hey, you're not on time. I'm more on time. There's probably something wrong with you. Drawing out benign intentions that are usually unseen by the couple. Uh, let me cite this example. Let's say uh, the couple decides to go to a movie together. And uh, one of the couple uh, is uh, kind of feeling tired, uh, had a rough day at work. Uh, but the benign intention is, well, I still want to do this because my partner has been waiting for a long time to watch this movie. So because he couldn't help it, he falls asleep inside the movie. And then uh, the partner notices it. And then when they come out, uh, he couldn't uh, engage in any kind of uh, uh, meaningful conversation about the movie. And then they, they're they off to the races. They're fighting about uh, you know, what happened, what just happened. So these benign intentions are usually not visible. So in my work with couples, I usually say something like uh, where we're going to make the invisible visible this time. All right. So that's where emotional cup, emotional acceptance comes in uh, and uh, using humor. All right. So uh, sometimes I say this to my couples. Well, have you been to an anniversary? Uh, let's say a 25th or a golden anniversary. Uh, well, what do you usually hear couples talk about? when they face each other uh, and share something about what they uh, have experienced throughout the uh, 25 or 30, 50 years of their relationship. Well, uh, usually there's some humor in it uh, because uh, humor uh, is a form of acceptance. All right. So that's unified detachment. Uh, there are more, but uh, Hopefully, once you're more interested, you can go dive into the books uh, about IBCT. Uh, as far as I know, I only know of two books about IBCT. So the two main tools are really four. Uh, Jacob, you're going to love this. Being more noticing. Uh, I read this from uh, Act Matrix. You know, there's only one rule you need to follow in Act, which is being more noticing. So being more noticing of the context of your partner, uh, of the more vulnerable feelings that you don't see most of the time in your arguments, and uh, being more objective. So that uh, th the second one is about unified detachment. The first one is about uh, having a empathic joining uh, for the couple. So being more objective is unified detachment. Uh, having a, a, a sort of like what we say in act, we get out of the weeds and climb up a tree and see what's going on down there. So this is one of the critical parts of IBCT. Uh, it's called a deeper view. So uh, this gives them a framework of understanding their uh, conflicts and why they get into that uh, self-amplifying loop or a self-reinforcing loop of arguments. Uh, D stands for differences. Emotional sensitivities, the so first E. The second E is external stressors. And the last one is patterns of communication. So uh, differences can stand also for compatibilities or similarities. So one of the... Uh, quotes from a humorist that's included in the book uh, about uh, uh, IBCT uh, is uh, marriage is choosing the right partner with whom to be incompatible. So incompatibility is inevitable. Uh, and usually couples run into trouble because they see their differences as, as defects. So whatever they find attractive before uh, has become a, a defect. So it's a sort of a light bulb moment for a lot of couples when they realize that 
oh, uh, that was something I liked about this guy. Uh, he was a quiet person. He, I found him mysterious. And of course, uh, once you get married, you found that he's quiet and he does a lot of gaming at home, uh, online gaming, and that can be a source of conflict for a couple. So differences and similarities can be a coin with the flip side. So emotional sensitivities or emotional reactions. Now, these can, this is what we, we always hear people uh, talk about. It's uh, sort of like uh, a cliche, uh, the emotional baggage that uh, couples bring into a relationship. So this can spring from uh, past history uh, as uh, individuals. So their families of origin, their uh, backgrounds in schooling, uh, their backgrounds at work. So in IBCT, we do get into some of that background uh, information uh, between the clients. Because let's say one of them is a marketing executive and the other one is a computer geek. So that's pro that provides a context for conflict. So past relationships. So if uh, one partner experienced uh, abuse or maybe infidelity in a previous relationship, that can develop into a sensitivity uh, in the next uh, relationship or the current relationship that they're at. So. Again, in, in ACT, we say there's no delete button. So this is what emotional sensitivities are all about. And also their current history in their relationship. So I don't know if I have time, but it, you can take note of this. Uh, I read a, a book by uh, Joanne Dahl uh, and et al. Um, I sometimes use the metaphor of the jogging partner. So if we have time, you can uh, remind me of that uh, metaphor. If you're not aware of it, I'll uh, discuss it here. So current relationship. So if, if there's been a history in the relationship, let's say they started off when one person was about to end the relationship but was still seeing the other person and disclosed this to the partner, of course, this will develop into a sensitivity uh, for the other partner uh, to think that if you can do that to that person, what makes you think, what, what would make me think that you can't do that for towards me? All right. So I usually ask couples when I talk about external stressors, there are three things that are definite uh, when it comes to life. I don't know. I think I'm making good time, so I'll probably do with some uh, audience participation. What are, do you think are the three things that are guaranteed in life? <laughs> Feel free to speak out. I, I don't know how if I can see the chat box from here. I only see my big screen. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Jacob, if you see anyone ch putting it in the chat box, uh, let me know. So, of course, we know about any... Any guesses? What are the three things that are definite in life? We you know. We have people saying uh, uh, change, in laws, death, and taxes. Okay. And again, taxes and death. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. All right. So change happens. So most of the time, uh, couples are not aware of this. Uh, you know, in the act book, it's harder to keep a car brand new than just allow it. Oh, there's a, I see the chat box now. All right, in-laws, that's, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I never thought about that. Thank you. All right, so change happens. I, external stressors are anything or anyone outside the couple. So what the external stressors do is they heighten their emotional sensitivities and their differences, all right? So 
uh, if you have somebody who's very responsible, you like this person because he's not like my ex, who's lazy, who's always drunk, and then you end up working with this partner in, in Asia, uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of, you would encounter a lot of couples who work in the same business together. So when there's uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, concerns about the business that they run together, then it heightens their differences when one is uh, less uh, anxious than the other person. Okay. So that's the role of external stressors. And then we, uh, uh, we talk about the patterns of interaction. So anything that can be experienced by the five senses, like Jacob likes to do this with the act matrix. Sorry, Jacob, if I pick on you. You're the only person I know I can pick on here. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's, a, I think, the bottom half of the act matrix. Uh, and body language, uh, you know, a roll of the eye, a snub. Uh, these are all uh, patterns of communication. Uh, even silence or acts of omission, what they don't do. So when I talk about this in my uh, feedback session with my couples, uh, I, I use the fire alarm uh, metaphor. And again, I'm not sure if I have time to share all of that, but I can reserve that. You can take note of it and ask me about it for those who don't know what the fire alarm metaphor is. I got it from uh, Nicholas Ternicki's book, ABCs of uh, Human Behavior. So since we are a religious country, Christian at uh, that, uh, I sometimes do mention this, the serenity prayer in my sessions. Uh, it's basically uh, knowing what to, uh, what you're, we're capable of changing and what we're not capable of changing, but are better off accepting and uh, being able to distinguish one from the other. So among the deep, all right, analysis, what are those that are most open to change? So there are only four. So as we know in ACT, you know, the gun to your head, you can't change, you can't uh, relax, you can't think happy thoughts, but you can walk like a duck, like uh, Russ Harris would say, right? Or you can be kind to your partner. So these are patterns of communication that are most open to change. Uh, external stressors may or not, may not be open to change. Why? Uh, because let's say, hey, give up that uh, promotion or you're not going to have enough time for me. Well, you give up the emotion and uh, uh, the promotion, then you don't fight about uh, time, but you might fight about that trip you wanted to make, let's say for Europe. All right. So external stressors uh, may or may not be open to change. In Asia, there's a lot of uh, external stressors about uh, uh, extended family or living with in-laws. So what are better off accepted? Differences and emotional sensitivities. Of course, there's so, there are only two left. Okay. So basically, we're not going to change them as people. And I sometimes say this to the couple that I see. Well, as long as it's your differences... And your emotional sensitivities, they're all internal. Your partner doesn't see that. You know, it's internal. It's not a fight as long as it's inside. So I'll turn to the paradox of change. Uh, I think I'm doing good time. Uh, which one? What is the best way to change or one of the best ways to change? What do you think? Any, let, let me see if I can see the chat box. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I, I gave it up. All right. So change is the brother of acceptance, but it is the younger brother. So when acceptance comes first, it paves the way for change. <clears throat> so as you probably all know, as therapists, a curious paradox is that when I am, uh, when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. And it's true also for couples. 
So finally, the mindfulness approach. Uh, it is, I think, a mindfulness approach to couples therapy, and IBCT does claim that. So it's all about mindfulness in sessions. So in IBCT, we do weekly questionnaires. So these uh, weekly questionnaires focus the discussion. So if you've been through one of uh, the workshops, uh, Russ Harris, he would say something like, our minds like to multitask. Uh, so couples like to do that in session. They wanna talk about the very first time they met. Uh, they wanna talk about uh, uh, something uh, that happened two weeks ago to 20 years ago. So uh, the weekly questionnaires kind of lets them uh, become aware of what happens during those interactions that gives them trouble. So it's not about finding blame or fault. So if you're into your work with couples, then you'll probably notice a lot of them do this when they come into session. And uh, I usually uh, premise my uh, sessions with my clients and I ask them uh, uh, and I tell them that, uh, you know, I'll be taking each of your perspectives here and I hope you don't take it that I'm taking one side or the other. Because if I do that, I won't be doing anything new that you're already doing on your own. So if I do that, I'm just adding one more voice to either one of you. <clears throat> so, and I, I want to be fair. And if you sense at any time that I'm not uh, being fair, uh, just let me know so we can uh, deal with it. So understanding what happened, again, this is uh, context sensitivity, uh, understanding their deep and being able to handle them better. So it's uh, not uh, running away from those difficult conversations, but having them and uh, trying to handle them better. So uh, what is the role of mindfulness? Well, in IBCT, we have foresight mindfulness. I just uh, made this up. Present moment mindfulness, hindsight awareness, or hindsight mindfulness. So in the weekly questionnaires, uh, we, we ask them about past negative interactions, past positive interactions, or maybe future challenging events. So what this develops in the couple is that they're able to, let's say, be prepared. You know, I, I remember when I was new to ACT, uh, I tried to make myself more mindful of moments when I feel like there will be challenges. Like when I have to talk to maybe the bank about some kind of wrong transaction or some complaint, then I have to be mindful of my words mindful of my values, mindful of my feelings, et cetera, et cetera. So present moment mindfulness is for the couple to realize uh, when they're escalating so we, they can be able to de-escalate their fights. And hindsight awareness is that part where we have uh, unified detachment is knowing that uh, they're not going to change. Uh, their differences and sensitivities will not change anytime soon. And uh, noticing that from hindsight and uh, taking a more objective stance uh, and noticing that their minds uh, like to create stories. So since I'm Asian uh, and probably hopefully uh, a lot of you know about Tai Chi uh, I, and I usually say this to my clients, uh, let's slow down here. Uh, this is the chi Tai Chi. Let's do a little bit of Tai Chi. Uh, this is a Tai Chi for couples. Because I also say this to my clients at the start. Sometimes uh, life is lived in the moment. Uh, it's not lived in the past or in the future. Uh, it's lived moment by moment. And the reason why you're here is because these moment moments have accumulated. Remember cumulative annoyance. Uh, these criticisms, these rejections, uh, these unreasonable demands have accumulated in your history as a couple. And how do you uh, handle that better? Because the challenges will never end. They will continue and as long as they have this thing in between their ears. All right. 
So that's the end of my presentation. And I have I still have one minute before 11.45. <laughs> I made good time. All right. So uh, I'm open to questions now. And thank you for uh, staying awake. <laughs> I don't know what time it is in your time zone. Uh, I know Jacob, it's, probably, it's close to 12 midnight, I guess, over there. Uh, let me see. How can I view if there are any chat? Sorry. No, Angkor. I don't think we have time for that. May I know more about the metaphor of jogging partner and fire alarm? Oh, thank you. Uh, Voon. Is that Voon? I uh, can't see Voon. Uh, all right. Anyway, so the jogging partner. Let's start with that. Uh, I think uh, it was part of uh, the differences and emotional sensitivity slide that I talked about. All right. Uh, this was from the book, uh, The Diet Trap by uh, John Dahl and uh, company. Um, it's like you are, the couple is, a, 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 are jogging partners or is a jogging, are jogging partners. All right. The couple are jog, jogging partners. Oh, 945. Oh, it's still a good time for Andrea. Anyway, so. Let's say they're also, besides being jogging partners, they're also training for the Olympics. So they're really competitive, all right? And at the same time, I'm not quoting the exact uh, metaphor in the, the diet trap. Uh, this is my version of it. And, uh, and then it, they're also very good friends. They love each other to death, all right? So every Saturday morning, they go out and do their jogging together. So it's like killing two birds with one stone. Uh, being able to train, uh, compete against each other, other kind of uh, uh, push, push, push each other to the limits, their limits, and also spending time, uh, you know, connecting uh, with each other as friends. But one day, uh, one of them gets injured. So because of the injury, that friend can no longer run as fast as the other. So that that means uh, it's no longer for a dual purpose that they're doing it. Uh, they're not training themselves uh, to be better athletes. Uh, so the only reason that they would get together on a Saturday morning to jog uh, is to be with one another. So I'd ask the couple, uh, you know, would, would you still continue jogging with your partner? So that's the, uh, that's the metaphor there, that all of us have uh, injuries from the past. So that's the emotional sensitivity part. And the fire alarm is similar to the gun metaphor uh, when I talk about patterns of communication uh, because there's an assessment uh, 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 period of four sessions in IBCT. So when I talk about patterns of communication, if I have time, I would say, okay, if we were all in a room and a fire alarm goes off, will, will we all be surprised or startled? or scared, or sometimes even mad, because uh, one of us is familiar with the place and there are usually false alarms, okay? So I'll ask my couple, uh, well, will we, will we get startled? Yes, of course. Uh, can we control that? No. Is it our fault that we're uh, startled? No. If someone was more sensitive to, to fire alarms, uh, can we blame that person for being more sensitive to fire alarms? No. All right. So that's part one. We don't have any control over it. It's not our fault. It's not our responsibility. <clears throat> now, but there's a part two. We can uh, panic, uh, jump out the window, or complain all night, 
uh, not able to do anything but, you know, uh, rant about what happened and uh, it ruins our night or we can't sleep and there's work tomorrow morning or we can just calmly check if there's an actual fire or uh, go out through the fire exits. Well, that's part two. Do we have more control over that? And usually a couple would say yes. Uh, and uh, if we jumped out the window and, or we ruined our night just complaining about it, uh, is that uh, part our, partly our responsibility? Yes. So that's how uh, it works for uh, these uh, metaphors work for uh, IBCT and the way we do assessment. So in IBCT, there's the initial session and there's the individual sessions in between. And the last session is a feedback session. So th those are all assessment sessions. And uh, in my experience, uh, some couples do like that because they want some kind of structure in the way they do therapy. And uh, I forgot I was going to say something about uh, what this, I uh, informed the couple at the outset. Mm, anyway, if I do remember, I'll I'll come up with it. Anyway, uh, we still have about, have about nine minutes left. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Avun. All right. All right. Hope that was helpful. Uh, yeah. I forgot about what I was going to say regarding how you prepare your couples uh, to the session uh, or for IBCT. But if it comes up, I'll, I'll let you know. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. I had a question. Hi. Um, hi. You, hi. You were talking before when you were talking about unified detachment and drawing out the benign intentions that are usually unseen by the couple. And I was wondering if, they, if there's a way you use that maybe you can tell us so that the other person doesn't feel like they are like showing off or throwing it in their face because I've had like individual people in my consultation that when I suggest some sort of way like this to tell their partner that they're doing this effort to go out even though they're tired. Um, when they come back, they're like, no, they got more mad because they feel like they're um, just being annoyed by going out. I always state the fact that the tone and the way that they say it is very important, but however, the other person feels like they're throwing it in their face that they're doing this effort to go out. So maybe if you had any suggestions, that would be great. <laughs> Yes. Oh, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, Leah, is that right? Okay. Yes. Leah, um, it's hard to really demonstrate, but basically uh, it's using your counseling, uh, you know, counseling skills to empathize and kind of go deeper uh, into the emotion uh, or into the intent that was not visible. Uh it's hard to do without demonstrating it uh, in an actual uh, uh, counseling session. Uh, with your counseling skills, you probably know how to go deeper into what the other person is saying. So there are a couple of videos uh, wherein Andrew Christensen himself uh, does the therapy with a heterosexual couple. And there's another person, I forgot his name. Um, he worked with a gay couple. So it's available on APA. And you'll see how they work with these couples and kind of, uh, let's say, uh, let me see if I can demonstrate it. Okay, uh, let's, it's, it's, it's like paraphrasing what the other partner has said. Okay, so you're saying that uh, at the beginning of this uh uh, con uh, this evening, because you you're such a shy person going up, growing up in your family, uh, it's not something you normally do, uh, you know, in past relationship as as well as uh, with your family because you're Asian or your whatever culture you belong to, uh, it's hard for you to say no. 
you really wanted to say no, but it was difficult for you because you didn't want to disappoint your partner. You really wanted to be there for her or him or them. All right. So it's kind of like just doing that, you know, empathizing and paraphrasing what they they may not be able to express, but you see it based on what you hear from them at the beginning of the session. And you can actually do that at the very first session. Those two APA videos, if you if you want them, I'm you can just email me. Uh, you saw my website, it's onelifeonly.net. I have an email there. But sometimes my email uh, my emails go to the spam folder. So if you have WhatsApp, I have a number there on my website. You can chat me up on WhatsApp. I can send you the link to those uh, APA videos. You pay a certain amount and you get uh, one year access uh, to that uh, to those two videos. And it's very you know you you realize less is more. You know, when I started listening to that or watching that uh, the video of Dr. Anderson and that other person. What are they doing? It's just basic counseling skills. You know, it's just empathizing, rephrasing, or sometimes even reframing. Uh, uh, all this, uh, all these things that they're kind of arguing about because what they see are usually the hard emotions. So in IBCT, we try to go into the soft emotions or from hard disclosure, we go into softer disclosure. All right. So I did I answer your question, Leah? Yes, you did. Thank you. Very good question. Thank you. Appreciate that. At least you were listening. There's one person listening. Jacob, are you listening to me? <laughs> Just kidding, Jacob. I know you are. <laughs> anyway. So anybody else? Go ahead, Jacob. Do your thing. Don't worry about me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anybody else? We still have uh, four minutes. Otherwise, uh, I, sorry, I couldn't get into the six flexibility skills. That will take another 30 minutes to an hour, maybe. So uh, hopefully that uh, this, this helped you. Well, I guess uh, whoever was, I think Eugene, you were the facilitator. Uh, thank you for, for the uh, smooth transition. Uh, to this workshop and uh, thank you Jacob I owe you this one thank you Jacob uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here okay thank you you're welcome thank you Leah thank you so thank how you. do I yeah. end